And hello good people of the internet, it is I, Tommy Kelly. This is Adventures in Woo Woo. This episode is another AMA, which is Ask Me Anything. It's a monthly thing we do where people on Patreon and on Discord send in a question for me to answer. And I answer to the best of my ability, given my current understanding, with the idea that at some point in the future I may change my mind about it, so don't hold me to it. Hopefully I will change my mind about some of these things, given that I have, you know, learned a bit more, gained a bit more insight, and just had a bit more life experience. If you would like to ask me a question, as I say, we do this every month, you can join up to Patreon at any level and you get your question answered that way, or just join the Discord and I will put up a thread once a month and uh, you can stick your question in there. So let's get quickly over to the first question. Grayson. Ever talk about your spiritual studies in therapy? I made a very conscious decision at the beginning of therapy that I wasn't going to talk about anything occult, spiritual or magic. And there's a whole host of reasons for that. One of the reasons was that I didn't want to spend so much time during the sessions, because I only had a limited amount of sessions, explaining exactly what it was that I was interested in and trying to put it in context and bringing, you know, the therapist up to speed and all of that kind of thing. And I didn't want it to become my therapy about that because I had very kind of distinct things that I knew that I wanted to talk about, discuss and kind of work through. And I didn't want to get caught up in all this kind of other stuff. And also just stuff in therapy or whatever, particularly around the early questionnaires that I had to fill out, <laughs> where you have things like, do you feel that there's things talking to you? I mean, obviously they're looking for actual mental illness, but that's like, you could answer, yes, I do feel that there's like the secret chiefs talking to me. And then you have to get into all that. And I just didn't want to be bothered with any of that kind of stuff. But also because I, I, I had spent so much time actually trying to solve all of this stuff through magical, spiritual and occult memes and hadn't got anywhere, or at least hadn't solved it satisfactorily. That I, I mean, at least there was some movement along, but there was never anything that actually got me where I wanted to be with some of this stuff. And so I wanted to try some complete new approach, something very separate to all of that, that wasn't the same thing that I was doing all over again, you know, that I'd been doing on my own. I wanted to experience a different way of looking at all of this stuff. There was a case towards the end of the therapy though when my uh, therapist told me that he had looked at some of my videos and there's something about that that i don't know it made me feel a bit uneasy and i kind of muddied something in a way and i kind of felt like there was almost like a, a trespass or something or stepped o over the line or something even though all my videos are of course public and you know anyone can watch them why couldn't my therapist watch them but i just kind of felt like it was obvious that I hadn't ever brought that up and it wasn't something that I was bringing in and then they brought it up and it kind of made me feel a bit icky even though what they were talking about was very positive around it and so it just kind of it felt like an intrusion or something a bit into my privacy or something but that like I mean again it's public what what do I expect it just kind of caught me off guard as well so yeah long story short no I didn't once talk about magic spirituality or the cult, although I did talk about if events, particularly the one of the damaged self and the young child thing that happened in the forest. I did talk about that, but I talked about it in, um, I suppose, less magic terminology than I would have had I been talking to someone like yourself, Grayson. Crow Crow asks, how's my mental health going? Um, my mental health isn't too bad at the minute, considering the state of the fucking world and uh, all that's going on around all that. I suppose the whole Ukraine thing, as it did most of us, took a, a lot out of me and made me question an awful lot of, uh, you know, why is this happening? What's all of this for? What's suffering? All of those kind of constant questions that resurge in our lives, that uh, if something like a, a war or some sort of big event, suffering type event where a lot of people are involved, that a lot of people unfairly kind of subject us to horrible things, absolutely unspeakable things that did take a toll on me. And I'm sure it took a toll on everyone who was uh, paying attention. I'm still working through this sadness thing that I, I just can't get to the root of. I can describe it exactly, but I don't know what the origin scene is. And I don't know how to get rid of it. I can't remove it. I can sit with it. I can just, you know, I, as I say, I can describe it. I can... Trying to see where it, you know, <laughs> sit with it, trying to see where it, it wants to take me or wants to explain itself or whatever. And it's just not going anywhere. And that's quite tough. And that can be quite all encompassing and overwhelming at times and very come in very very quick and um it feels it feels like um it feels heart like a heartbreak a mourning and uh, like someone has died it feels or something i have lost something it's almost like when i see how my child reacts to things and how it's this kind of a child cry or whatever of 
intensity of that, given that it is their entire world falling apart if their Lego breaks or whatever. It feels similar to that, that kind of all encompassing, can't see past it, childlike, emotionally Im immature type of sadness, uh, not being able to understand it, not being able to see past it, not really knowing what it is, feeling it's unfair. I could go on. Um, and I have in many places, so uh, I'll uh, not go on. But uh, yeah, that can be quite tough. But overall, I'm okay. I'm trying my best. I've, I've noticed different places where I'm, there's energy leaks, where I'm doing things that I shouldn't, that I'm getting involved in conversations with people that I shouldn't. And just in that they're going nowhere, and it's the same conversation, it's the same loop or whatever. And, you know, expecting something different each time. So each time, you know, I work on something new and I try to get better and not to do the same mistakes, not to fall into the same traps and try to become more rounded, grounded, better person, all of those things. But uh, yeah, I'm okay. But uh, I, I've definitely been better. I've definitely been worse. Um, but I really appreciate you asking me. Thank you very much. Eastling. How hard is it to regularly turn out a cult spiritual video content for your fans and patrons? How do you do it? Do you have any advice to someone who wants to follow in your path? Um, yeah, you have to want to do it. It has to be something that has to come out of you rather than something that you think you need to do in order to get somewhere. And that it's just something I enjoy and I definitely post stuff without any kind of want or need or expectation of anyone watching it or of anyone being interested or that it's going to get certain figures or do anything any of that. It's almost like a compulsion I have to get out. It's the same as kind of any of my creativity in that it's just, it feels like I've little say in it in that there's something that is needs to get out. I have to get out of the way of it or I have to in some way midwife it out, come into existence and almost as if I very little say in all of that. That said, practically there is some things that I, I do do, do do, in that I have set days for everything so I know that so Wednesday's podcast day, Thursday is vlog day, depending on what I'm at, different days, Mondays, or, you know, art days for the, the new divination deck or whatever it is, chooses for books. And if you get into that kind of pattern, that kind of rib rhythm, then it's much, much easier to stay on top of it all because you know what you're doing and you know what, what's within your, your scope, what you have time to do, much more manageable if you have a plan. And then sometimes yeah, you have to take a break sometimes every now and again. Like say for instance, when I was doing the daily videos every day during the, the, the first bit of the lockdown, the pandemic, you know, at one point I had to stop. And just when I started feeling that, you know, you just go, right, I can't do this now. It's taking too much energy out of me. Or same with the daily readings I was doing with the 40 servants. But uh, yeah, and overall though, you have to kind of find that you have to enjoy it and you have to want to do it. So that's not to say some days, you know, you're just not in the mood for something or you just can't face it and you still have to do it anyway. You still have to switch it on or whatever. Yeah. Want to do it, feel you have to do it, do it with no expectation, kind of plan it out for what you're able to do. Push yourself forward, but don't overextend yourself. Yeah, mostly it's, I enjoy doing it. So that, that makes it all this so much more easier. Grayson asks another question. Do you have any tattoos? Um, I don't. And um, there's a number of reasons for this. One of them is that the standard answer that a lot of people say is that I've never found something I really want to get tattooed on me, that I would want as permanent. Second reason, I suppose, is that I would really couldn't live with if I had a tattoo that was shit and that it, or it was uh, something that I look at and go, well, I could have done that better, even though I can't tattoo, but, you know, I could have drawn that better or I could have in some way, I don't know, it just feels wrong or it's bad art or something. I just, I would find that very, very hard to deal with. I can't even deal with a crease on the cover of a book most of the time, never mind a bad piece of art in my own body. But uh, the main reason why I have never got a tattoo is that I really just don't like how I look physically or my physical body or uh, and I don't really want to look at it and so even me going to a tattoo shop and having to take my top off or whatever to get the tattoo would be horrifying for me and it's not something I would do never mind then having to look at it after it's done or show other people or any of those type of things but I have walked a bit in that recently where it's gone swimming in the swim pool <laughs> which doesn't sound like a huge thing but it is for me when I when you kind of you know when anyone looking at you and stuff like that, it turns out no one's looking at you anyway, but it, that's not the point of anxiety and all of that type of thing. It's not logical. But uh, yeah, I went to a couple of times and that was fine. You know, it's just something I just have to keep working on and uh, not let it, not let it bog, bog me down, get me down, bring me down, all of those type of things. But uh, part of the reasons why I started doing the video stuff as well, rather than doing the audio, and why at one point I stopped doing videos was to try and get over disliking how I look and just holding me back and not doing videos and stuff like that. And then force myself to do it, stick my, my head in front of a camera and, you know, force myself to look at myself while I'm editing and all that. It can be quite hard if you're having a bad day and a big fat chinned Tommy 
Hello, this is Tommy Kelly. Welcome to Adventures in Woo, which, uh, you know, it can be hard. But yeah, that's a, a long, long winded uh, answer to do you have any tattoos? No, I don't. Abraxas. Why men, great till they gotta be great. Abraxas, I didn't know that reference and I had to look it up. And uh, good song. Turns out I'm 100% bitch. <laughs> or just a total bitch, I can't remember. I'm not down with kids, I'm not up with modern day culture. Old man, angry with clouds. That's the, the kind of era of my life I'm in now. Andrew Tyler. I'm extremely new to the Secret Chief scenario. Do you think that your uptake, uptake in communication with them is tied to world events, or could it all just be coincidence? Thanks and be well. I think it's nothing to do with it. I think we're kind of making a mistake that a lot of people make when you're talking to these people, if we are indeed talking to these people, let's assume we are for, the, for uh, this question, that they're not really concerned with world events in the way that we are concerned with world events. And it's not that they're not concerned, but it's just not the same interaction. There's a kind of this notion, particularly in theosophy, where uh, esotericism is sometimes, some, somehow described, rather than seeing world events, it's seeing the energy beneath them, the process that's playing out, the shadow, the role, all of these type of things that have been played out, the underlying pattern that has been played. And so they'd be concerned with the patterns rather than the events. To them, it's just... It's like you would watch a movie or something possibly that seems very kind of callous and I'm, I'm i'm sure from one perspective they have to feel it be a bit like that and kind of be separated but i don't think it there's a i would hope i can't speak from that there wouldn't be that kind of that it's not just like someone looking at statistics that removing the humanity that it doesn't matter about the suffering because these lives are an illusion all of that kind of stuff that can very easily squeeze in and come into all of these things so i would say the world is always falling apart, always. It's never not been falling apart since at least humans have been here. And um, there's always been something going on. At the minute it's kind of ramped up slightly, but it, like only to us, I mean, it's been a constant war in the other part of the world for years. And you know, it, it's now that it's getting closer to us, it seems like it's ramped up, but it's always been there. It's always, always ongoing. So I don't think, no, that it's necessarily anything to do with a crisis happening in the world or something like that. Although, you know, who knows? You know, I, I, it, I could be absolutely wrong in that, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels like they're not really that concerned, nor do they want to talk about that kind of thing. Anytime we do talk to them about stuff like that, like what's going on with Ukraine or Russia or anything, they tend to start saying things like, it's all an illusion, it's a dream, it's not what you think it is, and that kind of stuff. Which may be true, but from a practical point of view of people within it, is not that helpful. But that's not maybe, possibly, that isn't what their, you know, what their function is. Their function is to awaken humanity or to help on a different level. And us coming in and asking, go, well, what about, what about this? Is probably highly irrelevant to that kind of being. But then you have to ask questions, why are they talking to us in the first place? So they have something they want to share with us. Anyway, so long and short, I don't think it's anything to do with the cultural crisis that we have. Something quite spooky YouTube <laughs> cliche about this angle, with the bookcase behind me, but uh, please excuse me. Okay, Max, why do you think that the Holy Guardian Angel concept is a key feature of Western awakening traditions while numerous Eastern traditions seem to do fine without it? Good question. I would, I suppose, question the idea that the Eastern religions do 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 without it, that they, that they don't have it in, like quite a few of them do. In like, say, even in Hinduism, you have the idea of Atman, which is, depending on what way you think about the Holy Guardian Angel, it's a very similar type thing, which is, you know, the, the, the true self, the higher self, the higher being or whatever. Of course, in Theosophy, or particularly in certain brands of Theosophy, it's a separate entity, which, like, from a non-dual point of view, it's, it's not. But, I mean, in, in the dualistic world we live in, or the separated world we live in, it is a separate entity that hangs around for a while and then goes away once you have achieved a certain level. In Telema, or uh, Telema, excuse me, um, as far as I know, it's just God and it's a representation of God or it's the first movement of divinity towards you that you can accept. It's presenting itself in a way that you can understand for the first time. And then crossing the abyss, that you realize it disappears, it goes, but it's only because it never existed in the first place. And, you know, and it was, it was within you all along. And of course you have this idea in Buddhism too, in, in, a certain, in a different way. Like you do have the angel stuff, particularly in the Tibetan Buddhism of like the divas or the, you know, these kind of 
saints almost, I suppose, you're getting into that kind of thing, which of course is in Hinduism as well. But you have the idea of the Bodhisattva, which is in a sense, you know, a spiritual helper in this kind of thing. But then you have to ask, is it individualized, individualized in the Buddhist thing? As far as I know, it isn't really. I think a lot of the answer with the Buddhist thing is why it's not relevant is that they're kind of saying it's the wrong question. You know, just do the practice. Don't worry about these things. It's like their answer to does God exist? It's just the wrong question. But of course, you have another things like you have it in Zoroastrianism. That's I suppose that's get kind of more Middle Eastern than Eastern. It's in a number of things. But anyway, let's assume it's not though. Let's to, to, to take your, your question face value. Why would other schools or other kind of ways of approaching awakening work? equally well without something uh, that seems as integral as the Holy Guardian Angel. And I think the answer is going back to uh, that idea of if the Holy Guardian Angel is the first approach of divinity to you, then that can happen in any other way. And it doesn't need to be kind of put under this label or it doesn't need to be separated into a very, you know, indistinct, this one's for you, this one's for you, this one's for you. Everyone has a separate kind of Guardian Angel. So in these other places, you will be approached more, say, by a particular personality or a particular contraction of divinity in the form of a spirit or a god or a deity or something like that. And how often have you heard HGAs coming to people as forms of, of a deity, you know, under those names, those guises, those type of things. So they're probably working through the same things, only they're working with Ganesha or they're working with uh, Hanuman or they're working with Lakshmi or whoever they are, but it, it's fulfilling the same kind of function of the approach of divinity for you to, to call of divinity it's always been calling you've decided to call back or to answer that call and in that way it, it can be fulfilled by any amount of things just in the western magical tradition or the western western mystical tradition we have contracted it labeled delineate, delineated it delimited it into this form of holy guardian angel long and short of it is no but uh, I would question whether it isn't actually uh, present in the Eastern stuff that we probably think it isn't. Is it just under a different guise? And even if it isn't, you still have the same process, the same functioning, the same pattern emerging, only in a slightly different way. What do you think? What, what, what do you think, Max? What, what's your answer to that? What's your thoughts on that? Emilio, what do you think Henrik Cornelius Agrippa's work would look like if he were alive today and writing for a contemporary audience? I'm not really sure. I have to uh, admit my, uh, here that I don't know an awful lot about him. I've never actually read uh, the three books of uh, philosophy or the fourth book, but don't really know much about his life either. It's just something that never kind of gravitated towards or kind of come up, and I, I do plan to rectify that. But I do know him, him. He's, he's quite uh, sarcastic and a bit biting, so he'd probably, <laughs> he'd be probably quite reactionary and probably not take that much shit. Um, he'd probably get cancelled. He would probably <laughs> not do well on Twitter. And uh, yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I, I can't really speak to his actual philosophy. I assume it permeates all of, uh, you know, modern occultism and it's all there in the same way all of these other people kind of, you know, you don't know that's where it's coming from. Like Eliphas Levy, there's so much there that we just kind of accept, but we don't really know what comes from him. I'm sure it's the same with Agrippa. So what I'll do is I will look into him. I'll read his book and uh, I'll answer that question again when I'm finished. Chris Haddock. Recently I've been wondering how to tell when you should be patient and let things happen and when you need to take action into your own hands. Some are related to yours and Spud's discussion and tasks about having to ask for things for short term versus long term gain. If sometimes suffering is necessary for growth and satisfaction holds us back from necessary change, do you think it's helpful or effective to do magic just for clarity of path? Like ask for a sign that suffering through it is worth it in the end or to change course because the suffering is pointless. Have you ever tried that? And if so, did you find it effective? Or am I describing the purpose of divination before magic in a convoluted way? In some ways you are and in some ways you're not. I think it is to ask for clarity on the path is always a good idea. It's never not a good idea because of exactly the things you're talking about, how to know whether you're needlessly suffering because you have programmed into you that you need, you should suffer because suffering is good, you know, and that it, it leads to, you know, you being a better person or to suffer means that you're a better person or all this kind of nonsense that sometimes is true, but sometimes isn't that, you know, as an actual rule, suffering doesn't necessarily lead you to be a better person, nor is it necessary in order for growth or change. That said, it, it, it's usually we don't grow or change until, you know, kind of we really have to. But it, I've had plenty of times where I've grow, grew or changed and ha had a kind of clarity around something by deliberately looking at it rather than life happening to me and then I ha had to look at it. If you engage in any kind of shadow work 
or working on yourself or personal development and all that you're going looking for trouble and you will find it but you know if you kind of aren't working on yourself i suppose in some way the opportunity for your growth usually comes when some disaster happens so there is a slightly different take on it when you're actively looking for it. You see, it's a thing I do suffer with from myself in that I, I don't know when the best time is to do this kind of stuff because you're kind of going, if everything that's for you won't pass you or if you in some way balance your life, things will work out, you know, the flow, the chi, the real man will all be there, you know, the Tao and all of this stuff. So what's the point of doing magic? Isn't magic then something that you're posing onto the, onto the nature of the world, you know, as it is? But then you also have the other side of it is that if you don't in some way impose your will on the world, all you're doing is reacting to the world. And that's not good either, you know? So it's it's kind of, it's a thing I debate with and, and struggle with a lot is going like, how do I know what I want is the right thing for me? How do I know that getting what this kind of thing I have in me, this desire to manifest in the world is ultimately going to lead to my highest good? And so I kind of tend to leave it and not do it because I, I kind of feel that handing over the reins, you know, letting a uh, jeezy crazy take the wheel or whatever that like, you will, what has to happen and whatever will emerge kind of naturally as a natural process or whatever out of that. I don't think that's always kind of true. I mean, if it is true, what's the point of magic? Then? What is the point of doing any of the things? What is the point of having desires? What's the point of having a will? What's the point of having any sort of creative urge or expression or something that wants to come out if what you really need to do is react to the world. So I'm getting more and more into actually deciding what I want and deciding <laughs> to make that happen um, magically, mundanely, etc, etc. And to hope that within it, that I will be able to, uh, yeah, the same one, well, be able to see if the struggle is worth it or not. I, that's not really answering your question, I understand, but uh, it's, best I can do is I feel your pain, I know where you're at, I know what, where you're coming from and it's something I'm all, I'm also working on to know that. Um, so to be continued I would say, uh, divination is always a good idea, is this the right thing to do? Taking with a grain of salt as well because you know you could be again when you do a divination for yourself you have your own kind of blinkers and your own kind of window that you're looking through or whatever, maybe get someone else to do a divination for you Someone who's not con you know, connected to the thing you're talking about at all. Let's see how it goes. But yeah, I don't know. Turismo. I'm having a tough time adding magic to the daily grind of the 9 to 5. Any suggestions? Well, the other than add, add, you know, getting up earlier, doing all of that kind of stuff, is kind of, I tend to do is double everything. You know, so if I'm drawing, I'm also listening to an audiobook. If I'm uh, get for a walk, I'm also listening to an audiobook. Uh, you know, so I try to get to get double for my time. And so I would say that if, say, on your travels or say you get the bus, do your meditation on the bus in the morning. Do something on your route. If you pass certain things in town, on it, you know that you walk into every day going to work or whatever. Start making that as a magical kind of practice. Do kind of stuff that start doing your offerings, your prayers, any of that time when you have free time, whatever it is that you're trying to to, to accomplish. Um, and kind of enchant your day-to-day -day life. When I come into the office every morning before I literally do anything else is I go to the altar and light some candles and incense and it's just part of what I do when I come in the door. It just becomes, you know, it's the routine, it's the thing that happens. I don't even have to think about it. Even if I'm in a kind of a rush or, I'm, you know, have to get into things, it's still kind of, that's what you have to do in the same way when you get up in the morning, you know, you wash yourself, you brush your teeth. It's just, you, you do it, you know, it's not so, it's something that you've already factored into your day. And then if, if you don't know, get into, if you're into, if you're working in a city, then get into city magic or stuff around that that you could probably incorporate into what you're doing. Make your, your kind of, your, if you work in an office, say, um, make your office space, your desk into your altar. Like it doesn't, you don't have to bring in like the goat's head and the virgin blood and the bat's wings, whatever. But I have kind of stuff in there that's a reflection of, of uh, some sort of magic thing. You know, like you could have a John Constantine model on it and, that would be a representation of your, you know, your magic goal or something like that, or even as a servitor or something like that. But people looking at it walking past would just go, oh, he's into John Constantine. You know, he's into superheroes or whatever. You don't have to make a big noise about it or just have some stuff that is uh, good for you. And then if people, you know, if you have something on your desk that's a bit odd, crystal of stone or something like that, just say, ah, it's my, you know, someone gave it to me for good luck and I just said, leave it there. You know, you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to tell everyone what you're doing. In fact, you shouldn't probably most of the time. Try to take what you have, take all the bits that you're already doing and see what you can add to it, what you can double up on, what you can uh, incorporate into, how you can change and what you can 
already doing into something more magical. That's all I can advice I can give you. The other thing, of course, is do a divination for it and see what it says, or do a sigil or create a servitor to give you more time or more space or more ideas about how you can incorporate magic into your life. And there we go. That's all the questions for this month. Another one done. I have to tell you, the heat in the office is getting unbearable. <laughs> it's just I usually have the windows open and mostly the door open too, or the fan on, but just due to noise level, uh, when I was recording this, I had to uh, turn them off. So at some stage, I'm sure there's just uh, more water than man uh, on the video screen. Anyway, if you would like to check out what else I do, just go over to adventuresmwoowoo.com and you'll find all, find all the links to the music, the comics, the articles, the magic, the 40 servants, the four devils, all of the things. If you would like to support what I do, then you can join up the Patreon. The link is in the show description. And there's a lot of stuff over there too. Join the Discord. Send me some money through a PayPal donation or on YouTube. You can now send on a, it's like a super tanks, super tanks or something. Um, buy me a book off my Amazon book list. Um, send me good vibes, man. And I don't know, virtual hugs are always accepted. So good people of the internet, until next time, be well and may your best days be ahead.